Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Douglas, and I am one of the business development managers here at Buki. Today, I will be moderating our first installment of Supercritical Chats, where we demystify SFC. To help with today, I have my colleague Maddie Hogan on with us. Maddie is one of our resident chromatography specialists, and she is here today to help us understand the technology behind supercritical fluid chromatography, also known as SFC. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, so I've worked in the industry separating a wide array of compounds using various techniques. Um, so I'm really excited to see SFC added into our product portfolio, and I think it's a great technique that a lot of our customers can really be taking advantage of. All righty, so let's get started with the basics. Um, what is a supercritical fluid? Yeah, so a supercritical fluid is just a substance that is held above its critical pressure and temperature. Essentially, it has both properties of a gas and a liquid. Okay, you don't really see supercritical fluid much in someone's day-to-day -day environment. How does something reach that supercritical state? So it's not the preferred state for most substances at atmospheric conditions. Um, in order to work with supercritical fluids, you actually need a system that's going to generate enough pressure and at a certain temperature to keep the supercritical fluid in that state. Okay. And remind me, why do we care about supercritical fluids? So supercritical fluids are really interesting. Um, they have really interesting properties like density and viscosity and their unique ability to solubilize compounds. Um, without getting too much into the weeds with the technical details, it actually facilitates a faster and more efficient separation for a wide variety of compounds. Um, but for listeners who are interested in all the technical details, we do have another webinar that goes over all of this and we can link it in the description here. Well, that's some pretty neat stuff, but are supercritical fluids hazardous similar to organic solvents? Well, it depends on what you're using as your supercritical fluid. But luckily, most applications actually just use CO2 as the supercritical fluid, which is far more environmentally friendly um, than your average organic solvent. And usually at room temperature, it just kind of evaporates. Now, let me ask, is SFC similar to other chromatography that most folks are more familiar with? Yes. So the biggest similarity um, between all the techniques that people use, whether it's flash, prep HPLC, or SFC, chromatography is done by adsorption and desorption of the sample between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. Um, so that's not changing. Flash, we consider a low pressure normal phase chromatography. PrEP HPLC is a high pressure reverse phase chromatography. SFC is unique because it blends the two approaches. We consider it a normal phase chromatography like flash, but at high pressures like HPLC. It's a flexible te technique that can act like either flash or PrEP HPLC, depending mainly on what stationary phase you're using. And how do these methods compare in terms of sample throughput? Well, traditionally, you know, flash is considered high throughput process with a lower resolution. Um, Prep HPLC is a lower throughput process with a very high resolution. Um, as we mentioned before, since SFC is a blend of these two techniques, SFC is actually going to offer a higher throughput similar to flash, but matching the resolution of PrEP HPLC. So why can't we run supercritical fluids on the LC or HPLC instrument that we already have in our lab? Good question. The reason is that those instruments are unable to achieve the pressure needed to maintain the solvent in a supercritical fluid state. That's why you need something like the Sepiotech SFC. All right, so we got the basics down. Now walk me a little bit through the nuts and the bolts of the system. Right, so we're gonna frame this using CO2 as our supercritical fluid, since that's the most common practice. Um, in this case, a CO2 pump, um, which is just a binary pump, 
uh, will feed liquid CO2 into the system from either a doer or a high pressure cylinder. Um, since the CO2 is basically an HPLC pump, um, it's very similar to what you've already seen. It just happens to have a chilled pump head to keep the CO2 in its liquid form. Now then a second pump will feed something called the modifier, which is usually a small amount of organic solvent. And those two solvent streams will meet in a mixer. Okay, so correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but the modifier is used as a co-solvent in the separation. Yes, just as you would have like an A and a B solvent in a flash separation or a prep HPLC separation, the CO2 and modifier are your A and B solvent. So those two solvents are mixed and they make their way toward the column. But before it gets to the column, the sample is injected into that mixed solvent stream. And I'm assuming this is when we start to increase the temperature. Yes, so this is where that increased temperature comes in because we're already at an increased pressure. The column is actually held in an oven and the oven raises the temperature enough to reach the supercritical temperature, causing that phase transition from liquid CO2 to supercritical state. The supercritical mixture then passes through the stationary phase or column where the adsorption and desorption process happens. Uh, this separates the complex mixture into its individual components and it will exit the column and flow through a detector. Okay, so how do we can collect the sample fractions from the supercritical state? So once the mixture exits the column, um, we need a pressure regulator to depressurize this mixture. So we don't actually collect it in the supercritical state. So once it goes through the depressurization process, the stream goes through something called a gas liquid separator. Here, the CO2 is actually going to mostly evaporate off and the remaining sample will be collected in the modifier solvent as a liquid. So if I follow what you're saying, the collected sample will be a very small amount of solvent since most of the CO2 has just been evaporated away in the gas liquid separator. Does that sound about correct? Yeah, you're just really left with a small concentrated sample. Roughly, I would say in about a third of the amount of solvent you would see in a typical liquid liquid separation. Um, so it makes for a pretty easy dry down or concentration process. Now, since our fractions are in small volumes of modifiers, um, are there issues with the sample crashing out a solution? So the modifier solvent is usually a pretty low percentage, um, so that can be a risk. Um, but we do have a solution. There's something called a makeup pump. Um, so that actually feeds a little bit extra liquid solvent to ensure that all your separated sample um, as the supercritical fluid is being evaporated away as a gas, it will actually stay in the liquid solution. Now, in my past experiences with PrEP HPLC and FLASH, I could always increase and decrease the flow of solvents to match the size of the sample and then the column that I'm processing. Um, is SFC a scalable process? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So an SFC instrument is not a one size that fits all instrument. Um, for example, here at Buki, we offer three sizes of SFC unit, the SFC 50, 250, and 660. It's actually really important to choose the right size for your application. You know, smaller scale applications will run more accurately on the SFC 50 versus the SFC 660. And this is mostly related to maximum flow rate for each model and what they can achieve. You know, a higher flow rate um, means a bigger column, which can process more sample, but you're not gonna put a teaspoon of porridge in a big mixing bowl. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> well, this sounds like a Goldilocks situation. You have to pick just the right fit. Um, but hey, we have something for everybody, don't we? Yes, Goldilocks is the perfect description. Um, but yeah, speaking of something for everyone, um, you can't forget to mention the accessories and the customization options. Well, how could I forget to talk about accessories? And I think there are a few different options to help customer with their SFC instrument, correct? Oh, yeah. Um, 
So let's talk about the first one, which is methods of detection. Um, I would say the most common and well known is UV detection. You know, you see the peaks on the chromatogram and they more often than not are going to be corresponding to the UV absorbance of the sample. Um, so that all comes standard on the Sepiotech instrument. And of course, we have ELSD, which stands for Evaporative Light Scattering Detector. Um, this is really a, a mass detection modality. We often use uh, these when the compounds are non-UV active or, or do not possess a chromophore. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, a lot of our other instruments, chromatography instruments, have an ELSD, so it's also an option on our SFC unit. So other than ELSD and UV, are there any other detection methods that we have not touched on? So there's actually a really cool option to add a mass spectrometer. Um, the user can actually monitor the mass splitting of each peak during the run. Um, and this sort of mass detection is really ideal for peak identification, especially in your achiral separations. So, you know, we touched on detection methods other than our detection methods, do we have some flexibility when it comes to the stationary phase that you're going to be running? I'm glad you mentioned that because stationary phase actually offers some of the most flexibility when it comes to optimizing a separation, even on the SFC. Um, so many stationary phases or columns can be used on the SFC, like C18, chiral stationary phases, bare silica, um, you know, the world is your oyster. Well, some chiral stationary phases that immediately come to my mind are uh, um, immobilized polysaccharides, uh, coated polysaccharides. That sound about right? Exactly. You can use those. And, you know, you can even use all your LC chiral columns that you already have in the lab. Um, but the only difference is you're going to be able to run them two or three times faster on the SFC. And can you run them at the same time? Well, our SFCs um, do have this pretty neat option of a multi-column oven. Um, so you can either have a two-column capacity or a 10-column capacity. So this means instead of constantly swapping out your columns or your stationary phases, um, you can actually put multiple columns in the same oven and easily switch between them uh, between runs. And the benefits of having multiple stationary phases readily available would be more efficient column screening, correct? Yeah. So if a user had a variety of samples with different characteristics, then testing multiple stationary phases will absolutely give you a better idea of what's going to yield the best, most efficient separation. And if you're processing large amounts especially, uh, you really need to find the right method. And how would that column switching happen if they're both in the same oven? Well, usually that's um, controlled by the system software. It has the most to do with that. Um, the software will control a valve that just switches between each column in the oven. Um, and, you know, while we're on the subject of software, a program software and user inter interface is actually super important when you're considering system flexibility. I mean, when you think about it, we all use and interact with interfaces every day. Uh, you know, I couldn't live without my iPhone, so I really do appreciate a good user interface. Right. And, you know, all the method parameters that are being adjusted is done through that interface and software. So queuing runs, choosing flows, um, columns, even seeing what mode of detection that you're using. Um, it's all done through the software. Um, we do have quite a few parameters we can optimize depending on application with the help of our accessories. Um, ha but how are samples collected? Ah, yes, fraction collection. Arguably one of the more important aspects of separating quantities of sample. Um, you obviously need a way to recover them afterwards. <laughs> right, so what would be the best way? Well, um, it's pretty application dependent, really. Uh, you can collect in large bottles if you're running uh, repeated sample injections. 
Um, this is usually in the case of chiral separations, um, and you have repeated injections of the same material with only two or three peaks. Um, you know, the same fractions from multiple runs can actually be consolidated in single bottles, making for pretty easy cleanup and concentration. Um, but if a user is running an achiral separation with single runs, we offer a fraction collection bed, which may be a more useful accessory in that instance. Individual fractions can actually be collected in test tubes similar to that of a flash or a prep HPLC fraction collection system. So it really does sound like it's applicated. Yeah, I mean, one can say all chromatography is application dependent. Yeah, you got to choose the right instrument, accessory or tool, really, that's going to make your job easier. Well, what I'm really taking away from this conversation is it seems like the SFC unit provides that flexibility while also guaranteeing the performance of your application. Absolutely. You know, the applications for SFC are numerous and to talk about all of them, we would have to do a lot more of these um, podcast discussions um, just to cover them all. But if someone had an interest in a certain application and, you know, what technology is going to be the most suitable, uh, I know I'm always happy to have a conversation offline. And, and myself, too. I know that uh, application discussions are some of our favorites to have. So if our listeners have a question, they should call you? Absolutely. Go ahead. Call, text, email. Let's talk offline. Um, all right. Well, uh, that's it for our first podcast on SFC. I hope that the information discussed today helped to demystify SFC technology. I also wanted to thank our chromatography specialist, Maddie, for her time um, and expertise uh, that she shared with us. Um, thanks again, Maddie. Yeah, uh, it was definitely my pleasure, Stephen. I'm actually really looking forward to having more chats like this with some of our other colleagues. So. Uh, everybody should stay tuned for our next chat where we'll be discussing the return on investment of CO2 use um, with our West Coast um, colleague, Michael Stewart. Thanks again, Maddie.